periodization gives us an approach to plan, you know, plan your training. So there's different approaches, but just remember it gives you a, a, a kind of a glide path to get to where you're at. You know, that's really the bottom line, the goal of periodization. The Triathlon Show 112. Hey, what's up, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of That Triathlon Show, the podcast presented by scientifictriathlon.com. I'm your host, Michael, and on today's episode, we're joined by coach Chris Myers, PhD, to discuss training periodization and more generally, perhaps, the big picture planning of training. We'll discuss how to go about this big picture planning and also cover different periodization models, we'll answer questions like are certain models better suited for certain types of athletes or events or not? And is periodization even necessary at all? So just a little bit about Chris before we get started. He is a Florida-based coach with Peaks Coaching Group. So we got introduced through Hunter Allen actually after I interviewed him for episode 103 that you can go and listen to And Chris has a PhD within the realm of kinesiology and exercise science. He is a former pro-level cyclist and also a certified sports nutritionist. Just before the interview, a big, big thank you to our sponsors. First, Precision Hydration. They make electrolyte drinks of various strengths to suit different sweat rates and sweat sodium contents. And speaking of sports nutritionists, anytime a sports nutritionist has been a guest on this podcast, like recently Monique Ryan and Stacey Sims in episodes 99 and 105, they always discuss the importance of electrolyte balance. And you can't just rely on the standard sports drink sodium content because your electrolyte losses are individual to you and may not be covered by what sodium is in a standard sports drink. So all that Triathlon Show listeners can get their first box of Precision Hydration Electrolyte products for free on precisionhydration.com when you use the promo code that Triathlon Show, all one word, all caps. This episode is also sponsored by Ventum. And last week you heard about how Ventum is introducing a new model, the Ventum Z Mechanical, onto the market. And it's got the same superbike frame design as the normal Ventum Z and the flagship Ventum 1. But it comes at the cost of a normal tri-bike. So check it out on VentumRacing.com. And remember that you get 110% towards the value of your own bike when you trade in for a Ventum bike. So without any further ado, let's hear the interview with Chris Myers. Today's guest on That Triathlon Show is Chris Myers from uh, Peaks Coaching Group. Uh, Chris, how are you doing today? Doing well, Michael. How are you doing this morning? Excellent, excellent, especially after getting a lot of uh, information from you in our pre-interview chat, talking about uh, all things lab testing and, and other related stuff. So, so that was uh, brilliant to get, uh, get some insights from you because you, uh, Thank you. you do a lot of that, uh, that work yourself. Can you tell us a little bit about your, your research and uh, background in endurance sports? Yeah, so um, currently I work with human performance with uh, U.S. Navy divers down here at um, here in Panama City Beach, Florida. Um, part of it, uh, we look at the effects of diving on d- both uh, with normal gases and mi- different mixes of gases and how those and also with the effects of immersion affect human performance, both endurance, say running and cycling, and also skeletal muscle performance, you know, strength, power. And ultimately is – If we can quantify those effects, we can see what changes we need to make to diving equipment X, Y, and Z to better improve our diver's performance both on land and underwater. Um, Yeah. And and, and your your endurance uh, endurance specific background is uh, is what exactly? So um, I've been road racing for twenty plus years. Uh, I started road cycling uh, my sophomore year at West Point, uh, the United States Military Academy. 
um, where you know, I raced, um, and then I also raced in Germany for about you know, kind of kind of a neo pro for you know six years while I was on active duty, and then a couple years ago I did a full transition to triathlon, um, primary focus in short course. Um, I do that personally. I coach both uh, road cycling, mountain biking, and also short and long course triathlon. Um, along with, and by triathlon, I mean multi sport, both triathlon and do athletes, uh, both all the way from you know age groupers up to elites. Um, and I enjoyed working with every single one of them. <laughs> Brilliant. And today's topic is going to be periodization and uh, the big picture planning or macro planning of training. Mm-hmm. So a lot of the listeners of this show may be age groupers doing their own training or there are coaches uh, like you and I that plan their mm-hmm. athletes training. So but whatever the case, what that's uh, one of your specialties, your favorite topics. So yeah. let's dive into it. What, what do you have to say generally about the macro planning of training or periodization? How, how should we go about it really practically? Well, first, it gives you kind of a big picture. Um, I, you know, I like to know the path forward. Um, so because a lot of us, we like to try to think outside the box, but you need to map the box before you can think outside of it. And that's kind of one of the th- jokes I say with my clients. Um, because w- most of us, especially when we're talking about age group athletes, we, we're working professionals and we have families. And so we're, we have regular life that goes on, but we still try to do three sports on top of full, full schedules. And so by having an annual training plan, you map out kind of your way forward to reach your goals, you know, throughout the year. And so that allows you to plan appropriately to make sure that you give you the best chance to be in the best uh, form of fitness when you want to be. And that's... And, and what would... Go ahead. Sorry, what, what would that annual training plan look like if uh, we try to draw a picture of, of how people can go about doing it for themselves? Well, um, you know, part of it does, there's a couple factors I, I suggest that one look at, you know, one is your, your personal history. Um, how, you know, what's your historical fitness like? Are you new? Are you returning? Is it some, are you entering, let's say your fifth season or are you a professional? You know, um, you know, your fitness really depends your, on how one of those major factors on how you should approach it. Other is, you know, how experienced are you are in that, in, in that sport and how confident you are in X, Y, and Z. And also how much time do you have? Are you, are you, is your event six weeks away or is it a year and a half away? Um, so part of it, you got to take kind of those three, I say take those three factors and you kind of balance it all. Um, and so with that, there's a couple of different approaches to take when you're talking to annual training plan. And this is where the concept of periodization comes in. Um, so, so oh, sorry, sorry to interrupt you, but yeah. but let's first talk about before going into exactly like what the plan mm-hmm. uh, should, how, what it should be like, uh, just the the things that go into it uh, without taking any account of what form of periodization, if mm-hmm. any, you are using. But but kind of like if do you do you have like a spreadsheet with a week by week kind of note? This is roughly what I'm going to the type of training I'm going to be doing this week or the weekly hours training stress score yes uh, like what 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 does it look what contents go into the plan uh, taking taking out the factor of how you actually then populate those those cells or whatever <laughs> it is in your in your yeah, spreadsheet so, and, and what yeah yeah so i mean i you know personally i still there's a couple of different mediums i use um like for um i still personally use excel um i have a particular spreadsheet created for just say cyclists uh both mountain road or cyclocross whatever um, and also a separate one that is a little more in depth across all three sports for uh, multi sport. And so, but in each one of them, it pretty much encapsulates both the three major factors of periodization. You know, we we're talking about meso, uh, macro, meso, micro cycles, um, and starting from the top down. And so, you know, I, we have the big picture, we break up the, uh, the year or the big chunk of time into kind of the, the stages or the different training blocks per se or micro cycles or meso cycles you know the base period um you, know, you have the base period uh 
intensity competition and recovery periods. Um, I kind of denote those. I changed the names up a little bit, um, kind of in line with the way USA Triathlon uses is base period, pre-competition build, competition build and recovery. And then so underneath there, we I can break down into the uh, – you know, those macro cycles into micro cycles. And we get into the focuses of, you know, what are we going to, what are our goals for those? And what are we going to build on trying to develop limiters and build on strengths based, you know, and how it's all personalized based off uh, performance testing. And we also get into the numbers as well, how much TSS uh, for the bills to get to the right CTL ramp rate, where they are going to be with fatigue and fitness, X, Y, and Z. You know, all the same numbers that we can see in our training peaks in WKO. Um, there's another version we can use. Um, not everyone has access to it, but with training peaks, uh, they do have the, the automated annual training plan builder, which does take all these metrics and auto calculates it for you and help can really help you build your a basic annual training plan for yourself yeah and for the listeners that may find those acronyms completely foreign you can go to <laughs> episode 39 where i did a deep dive into training peaks and all its metrics and those uh, ctl chronic training load and other acronyms are used outside of training peaks as well in different circumstances so uh, go and look at that and also episode 72 was on wko4 if you want to look at that uh, but that's that's good so yeah we have mm-hmm. the uh, the macro cycle that we split up into the meso cycles the uh, general and specific preparation or base build and mm. uh, and race peak whatever and the terms that you use were uh, base uh, pre competition and uh, competition and uh, recovery whatever <laughs> we don't need to to talk about the yeah. the different terminology here that's not the important thing but having some sort of of structure to that and then the micro cycles being the actual training weeks and and then we want to know kind of how many hours or how much training stress training stress score and what the what the targets is it a limiter or a right. strength for a limiter and a strength so those sorts of things would go into into that spreadsheet if that's how you plan your training uh, to just to to wrap it all up was that correct Correct. Yes. Brilliant. Okay. So uh, next question uh, that I want to get into is: uh, Are there common mistakes that people tend to make when it comes to planning their training? Uh, first one I would say is recovery. <laughs> um, that is the first one that I tend to see, and also, um, and also, kind of, you know, I work with all my athletes on as well is how do you balance enough recovery in there? Uh, because no matter where you are in your, in your training plan or your training cycle is in order for the body to get better, it needs to recover. Um, you know, all that was all the work that you do in that previous training block, whether it's a two or three week training block, you're, you're tearing the body down. You're, you're increasing the stress and you know, in order for the body to, compensate for that stress it needs to needs time to relax it needs time to recover and so that you, sometimes you need to take half a step back to make two steps forward and so that would be the first one that i would say and, is, and, is, and it's the mistake right. that uh, people tend to just progress 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 you know in every single week or is it more on a on a weekly level that having a few a week or a few days or whatever the length of the block is of easier or is it how do you have any specific examples of of how what that mistake might look like yeah um so it you know like a traditional training block is a three by one three weeks on one week off right um especially during the base and the pre-competition builds um sometimes i just see it as a as a four by four where they go four weeks on nothing on. And then they go next into the next training block or they say, okay, I took one day off one or one or two days off in this entire four week period. That's my rest week. Um, no. Um, yeah, the body needs a little, definitely a lot more time than that. Um, if we look at just, you know, basic skeletal muscle physiology, you know, let's say you did an, an intense uh, weightlifting workout, um, it takes the muscle at least 72 hours to fully recover, to rebuild the active myosin bridges, X, Y, and Z. 
And so you need to build enough time in there. Yeah, I usually say, you know, about 96 hours as, as a minimum, you know, a kind of a quote unquote rest week. Uh, and then you start building back up and getting ready for the next uh, training cycle. Um, that so, and each person is different as well. Some need more uh, recovery than others, and so that's where knowing the knowing yourself, knowing your clients, and looking at the history kind of helps guide you with that. Uh, and so that I, that I think that'd be the first major thing I would say is you know one thing I always look out for and work with all my clients. Um, second is going too hard too often. <laughs> Um, you know, sometimes we just go too hard. You know, I know as a, being a triathlete, you know, I'm just, I need to get all this in. I need to do it. Let's, I may not be able to work out tomorrow. So I'm going to go extra hard today. Um, and so it's all about modulating intensity and duration too. And so, and trying to stay focused. So I'd say those would be the first, the two big ones that I work with on my clients, especially uh, when we look at macro planning. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, the, the last thing that you, that you mentioned is, uh, kind of what, something that I like to tell my athletes is to optimize for at, at the very least, like your the training week that you're in not the workout that you're in so if really attacking the workout that you're in now uh, it might be good it might be great it might be very much needed in some cases mm -hmm. but also taking into consideration the the context of where you are in your uh in your training period exactly. do you have do you have other hard workouts around maybe you 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 need to yeah modulate yourself keep your keep the reins a, a little bit and uh and uh, yeah to make sure that you get in all the workouts that week and not go super hard in that one workout and go over the targets and uh, then miss the next one because you're sore or don't perform in the next one and skip the hard parts just because you feel too tired so so exactly. yeah that's important exactly so so then okay so uh, are there any other mistakes before we move on to periodization no i think those are the those are the big ones um yeah, yeah. Great. Yeah, we're, we're looking for the big levers anyway yeah. and uh, to focus on. And that's uh, two things are usually enough. That's uh, that's a number that uh, that you can learn in one yeah. in one sitting and uh, and still remember. So periodization, then uh, what uh, can you briefly describe? We've talked about this in various podcasts before, so kind of briefly, but but still getting into what the differences of different periodization models and uh, methodologies are. Yeah, so let's first define uh, periodization. Um, you know, if you look at ACSM or the NSCA, it's primarily defined as the organized the organized approach to training that involves progressive cycling of various aspects of a training program during a specific training period. So basically, you have key focuses that build upon each other. That's kind of put in um, in layman's terms. Now there are several different theories out there for periodization um starting off with the classic that started off with um that was produced by matviev um which is what we know you kind of have your base period that builds into an, an intensity period then you have your competition and then recovery um if i remember correctly layered um i believe he, he was the olympic coach from the 50s that kind of took this took this approach from Matyev and applied it to endurance athletes. And that, that was kind of our first model, a classic model of the, of this, of this type of periodization. Um, it works well. It's good for, you know, it's actually an approach that I take with beginner. I like to take with my, you know, beginner athletes because it's a very structured approach. Um, there's another way you can take it. You can actually flip it on its head um, because if you look at the the base, this mat, this classic uh, version of of periodization, it's kind of like a pyramid, right? So the base period is your base is the the bottom part of the pyramid. It's the longest and the widest. The uh, the intensity phase is the next block up. Um, the intensity is a little bit higher, but the duration is shorter. The competition period is a smaller block, higher intensity, lower duration, and then your recovery period is that tip, right? Um, you can actually almost invert it for um, you know for some other athletes. And so, whereas 
you know, that tip, you know, you're doing the intensity first. And then as you get closer to the competition period, you're doing the, the base period. Um, it works for some people, doesn't work for others. Um, who, who do you think are there specific, you mentioned that, uh, the traditional model works well for beginners and the reverse version, who do you see that working well for? Is it very individual or are there certain groups or demographics or events that respond well to that? Don't take me wrong. Um, when I take uh, periodization approaches, it's for me, it's a very individualistic approach. Um, so it's because it, it, I take a look at their personal history. Again, those kind of those factors I mentioned in the beginning of our conversation is what is their, what is their historical background? Uh, what is their performance like in the sport X, Y, and Z? Um, you know, so because if someone's new to the sport, they're going to need a lot more You know, they need a lot more work with exercising to build their cardiovascular um, you know, foundation, skeletal muscle performance and all that, all those happy buzzwords, right? Um, and so that's – I would kind of start looking towards the classic approach. But if I have someone who's been doing the sport for a while and may, maybe they're crunched on time or we just need a different different approach, we may invert it. And I've had some success with it with some others and epic failures with others. <laughs> um, you know, for example, I have uh, an elite level mountain biker I work with in Europe. We've been together for about six seasons. Um, the first two seasons we took a kind of a, we start, we'd always start off with a classic approach and kind of move more into a nonlinear. We'd let nonlinear approach. We'd let kind of his performance and data analysis guide us, but we had a, Um, a couple of seasons ago, we had a hiccup where he couldn't work, do a couple of workouts in the winter due to life situations. And so he still wanted to do the Trans Alps, um, which is a seven stage mountain bike race there in Austria, Southern Austria. Um, and so we had, we took an inverse approach and we had success with it. He and his teammate placed third in their category. Um, so it, it just, And I've got as many other examples that where that type of approach failed when I thought it would be a good approach. So um, I guess long story short, it's really it goes back to the looking at the individual and how they react and what is their historical perspective on on their physical history. I mean, I've, I mean that's an important point because if uh, you read too much into like f things that you read in media or here on podcast then you might <laughs> think that that every ironman athlete should do the reverse pre linear periodization especially in recent years it's been a lot of talk about mm -hmm. that but but it's uh definitely as as anything in endurance sports it's the most important thing is the individual response and not mm -hmm. what uh yeah the, the generalized advice so so yeah i uh, keep keep looking at investigating what works for you as an athlete yeah. and not not what uh, anybody says that should work for you as uh, based on your events yeah. and your demographics right I, okay I, so let's let just sorry I, yeah i just on. want to point out one thing is you know I, i i am pointing out i'm putting out a lot of you know key terms and terminology and all this and we're talking about periodization but i think the boss line we need to remind your listeners and our clients and other athletes is really periodization gives us an approach to plan, you know, plan your training. So there's different approaches, but just remember it gives you a, a, a kind of a glide path to get to where you're at. You know, that's really the bottom line, the goal of periodization, especially for, you know, our, you know, for age group athletes and athletes like you and me. Yeah, that, that's a good point. And what we, that uh, kind of going back to the previous question with mistakes, something that I see a lot of age group, self coach age groupers do mistakes with is uh, planning their individual workouts to the most minute detail possible, but failing to have like a big picture plan at all. So if, if you take one of these frameworks, then you make sure that you, you don't miss that part. You have that big picture plan, which is so much more important than if you do five or six intervals and if you do two or two and a half minute recoveries <laughs> and that sort of thing. It, I, I, you're 100% right. And I giggle because I came across this with um, a buddy of mine uh, with one of his clients. Um, he, he had prescribed uh, hill repeats um, for one of his clients. Um, started off as a treadmill, but they wanted to go outside, which is fine. 
And the original description was three to five percent, I think somewhere around there for the slope of the hill for about five minutes at its, you know, zone upper zone two pace. Um, he kind of text from his client with a balance, you know, a lever, you know, on the side of the road showing the the incline of the hill, asking if that was good enough. <laughs> oh, that's funny. <laughs> that, that's really funny. Yeah, yeah. But it, but it, it highlights um, perilous by analysis. Um, you know, it's sometimes we get too much into the description. Like, okay, we have to do exactly this, and we forget we're doing this for fun too. You know, I mean, granted, we have goals and we want to do the best we can, but for the most of us. Um, we do this for fun. We want to be the best at it. Don't get me wrong, but it's for fun. <laughs> yeah. All right. So let's move on with the uh, other periodization yeah. methods and then briefly describing them as well. Yeah. So, you know, I talked with the linear, which is, you know, the classic approach. Um, there's also this idea of block, uh, block periodization, excuse me. Mm, I'm sorry. Uh, which was kind of proposed by Dr. Insurin, um, you know, kind of the early 2000s, um, late 90s, early 2000s. Um, and it's kind of, it's a play on the classic approach, but instead of four um, four blocks, again, you know, the, the classic, the, uh, the classic is base intensity competition recovery. With the block theorization, it has three blocks. We call it accumulation, transmutation, and realization. There's, <laughs> it's some interesting words, but essentially, um, what there's what he says is you have more highly concentrated training workloads to get this overreaching stimuli for to get to the the goal faster. Um, and so, and what it does is the one thing he addresses against the the classic approach is you're able to specialize a little bit more. Uh, whereas that he saw that as kind of a weakness in the, in the classic approach. Um, and then fine. And then finally, there's kind of like this nonlinear approach, um, kind of uh, what you and I were talking before, uh, that the coach for the Brown Lees take, uh, where it's, you kind of do a mix of everything throughout the week. So you're kind of hitting the different energy systems and, uh, you know, all the way from base, uh, endurance, all the way up to neuromuscular, um, intensities throughout the week. And it still has the undulating approach, you know, increased intensity, uh, throughout the training block with a little bit of recovery and, you know, what we see with traditional periodization images, but it's just a different approach on the micro cycles. Yeah, yeah. So compared to, for example, just to make it clear for people that may be new to all of this, like in a very traditional periodization, you might not do hit any real intensity in in the base phase. Whereas in an undulating, you you always keep keep some intensity, various intensity levels uh, throughout. So so that's kind of uh, the difference. It it undulates between between easier and harder yeah. uh, throughout the micro cycle rather than uh, rather than building from one meso cycle the bigger blocks to to the other. Mm -hmm. And and that uh, leads us nicely. First, I want to point out point out that uh, I have an episode on block periodization. I can't remember its number right now, but I'll link to that in the show notes so people can go and look at that. And uh, and then, uh, yeah, you mentioned uh, Malcolm Brown, the uh, the coach of the Brownlee brothers, and uh, he was actually here in Portugal recently, So and he was also a guest on the podcast, and that's where he kind of mentioned that they uh, they they do they every single week of the year almost they or 48 out of 52 they they do a hard track workout it's very it, it's a bit different when of course when they're close to race than when they're uh, around christmas time but they still do that hard track workout so that's so i started talking about how that is kind of an undulating uh periodization approach but the way he described it is that they don't really periodize training at all and that's something that dean gollish who was a recent guest also talked about that uh, periodization is not really all that it's cracked up to be and he mentioned uh, 
a publication by John Keeley, who may be coming mm-hmm. on the podcast in the future that okay. uh, you read, you read, and I read, and uh, it's about. It's called. I'm trying to think. Uh, Periodization theory confronting an inconvenient truth. So, so there's kind of you kind of already answered this question by saying mm-hmm. that it's a framework to plan your training on a macro level, which whether periodization in itself works or not is uh, something that you need to do. But do you have any mm-hmm. any additional takes on this uh, this whole discussion of is periodization necessary? Is it effective? Is it any better than not periodizing your training? What's your take on that? It's just a tool. Um, again, it's individualistic. Um, it's just a tool to, um, help you get to your goal. Um, now, yeah, let's not get into that whole discussion, um, if, whether periodization works or not, um, which approach is better than the other. Um, people have written whole books on it. Um, you know, it's, it's just knowing yourself, um, and figure out what works best for you. For me personally, um, as an athlete, I like to have a plan. Uh, that's the military side of me after being in the army for 15 years. Um, I like to have a plan. I like to know where I'm going. Um, I know that's a lot of what my clients like as well, but that's just the type of clients that I work with. Um, I've got other coaches who have been highly successful. They, they analyze and they just let the data tell them where to go. Um, and honestly, I think that's like one of the strengths of what we have now with the uh, software available to us, you know, particularly on Training Peaks or WKO. Um, I think, you know, also there's a couple of others out there as well that are just as powerful. And the analysis can get so in depth at this point, it can really tell you where to go or how to adjust effectively. Yeah. So, and let, let's get into that a bit, actually, because uh-huh. that's something that uh, that you you also uh, kind of have a big expertise in with the the, the analysis, and that's uh-huh. how individual athletes can learn if what they're doing is working for them individually yes. or not. So by analyzing how uh, how their approach is working, so so what would you suggest that uh, people do in for for that analysis part? Oh um, well. <laughs> There's many different ways you can go. Um, one, you need to have a base, a base metric to look at because you, you can't, you don't know if you're improving or not unless you have a reference point. Um, so that's why we, you know, it's one of the reasons why we do testing. We do an FTP test. Um, we do a swimming test, you know, critical swim speed test. We do critical running tests or even now with the advent of stride, we do critical power tests and running. You kind of have a base point. And so if you see a change in the positive direction from that base point, you know your training's working. <laughs> um, if it's not really changing, then maybe you need to change your training strategy up a little bit. Um, and so you can do look for that in the you know, in a macro sense in these programs. Um, and now if you want to dive deeper, you can start looking, for example, in cycling, you can do quadrant analysis with your pedaling stroke, um, you know, more than just the traditional uh, quadrant chart in WKO. You now have the ability to look at your numbers all across the entire four quadrants. You can see if you're producing more power on the bottom stroke versus the upstroke. If there is an imbalance, how is that affecting your performance? Um, is when is fatigue kicking in and how's that affecting performance? You can get into the weeds and there's a lot of metrics that can be looked at. And, and so, and that kind of gets us into, you know, a double-edged sword, you know, we can get into, I, you know, it's, we've all heard paralysis by analysis. You can just analyze so much where, you, you're getting confused or you don't know what to improve on, what to use as your measurement. And the other side is it could be a really great tool to get you to your goal better and faster. So it, it's just striking the balance. Yeah, exactly. And it's uh, it's knowing, being honest with yourself of wh- where your time is best spent. Mm-hmm. If, you, if you are looking to podium at Kona, then... Uh, doing that bit of extra analysis you're already training 20 hours per week uh-huh. and uh, and you you want to invest that little bit of extra time into into analysis to get the, those last couple of percentage points out of yourself mm. totally fine if you're training 
four or five days per week, then uh, may- maybe you should add that extra half hour that you spend looking at your workout on actually doing a longer workout or w- another workout instead. So, so, so there's a, uh, yeah, a balance as you, as you say, and, and not getting into paral. If you get into par- paralysis by analysis, then you're probably better off not analyzing if, but if you're confident in what you're doing and uh, then sure. But those tests, those are obviously great because they're simple, easy to interpret generally <laughs> at least. So uh, how often do you recommend people do them or, or does it vary throughout the season? How frequently yeah. you should do tests? Yeah, it varies. I mean, because you know, where they're at in the season, you know, base period, you know, let's say we're just taking the traditional periodization approach, right? So you're in, you know, you're in that base period, you know, uh, if you're, and during that period, you're doing a lot of endurance, you know, a lot more volume than you are intensity. And then, so your, your FT, let's just keep it in a bike sense. You know, your FTP is not going to change too much. It'll, it'll drift to the right. It'll get better, you know, by a few points, but it's not going to be huge jumps like two, two and 3%, you know, and the same with swimming and, and running. But during that period, I would test about you know, every six to eight weeks um, and maybe up to 12, depending on how long the base period is going to be. Um, then as we get closer to, you know, as we move to each block, as the intensity increases and so forth, and we get more specific in the training, then the, the testing does become a little more often. Because here's the thing is we can do all this analysis, right? It, it really comes down to is how well are you performing? Performance is the um, you know, is the king metric of all. And I think I got that from Dr. Coggin um, <laughs> when I first spoke with him, which was a kind of a great quote. Um, because you can do all this training, we can do all these lab tests. You know, you can say you're you're working hard and you're going you're in the lab and your VO2 max goes from 55 all the way up to 62. Your FTP went from 220 to 280, right? But if you go do your time trial. And you can't hold that 280 watts in a real world sense, and your kind of your your training program is still falling a little short. Yeah, and uh, that that's a simple a simple way to to, and that's how we want to keep it definitely uh, to look at it, and then then you need to change some things up and and see or find out what's what's wrong. Yep. So I think that uh, we have basically covered most everything. But if we can give the listeners like an an e- short, easy to follow step by step with a, just a couple or a few steps to what they should do and take away from this episode, what would uh, those things be? Uh, like r- really practical things that the listeners should take away and do. When yeah, when you're first starting to plan, you know, set off. Look at three things. One. Um, what is your history? Um, you know, what is your background in the sport or sports? You know, are you beginning? Are you intermediate? Are you advanced? Are you, or are you returning after a break? You know, get a good sense of that. Two is know your strengths and limiters. Um, what do you do well in? What might be holding you back? Third is you know, kind of break down into two areas. One is your goals. You know, what do you really want to accomplish? You know, you know, and be realistic, set realistic goals. And also how much time do you have to really get those goals? And so with those three, three, three or four factors, you can start your plan. You can set a realistic plan for you. And those, those will also help guide you which strategy you should take. And so those would be the four things I would say right off the bat that we every call, every listener should take home from this when when they're starting to look at starting macro planning for their training yeah and and i'll add to that that having a macro plan in the first place is a super important thing because again that's uh, definitely something that i i think I, I see as a very big and very common mm-hmm. mistake is not having having that macro plan at all and then and just flying by the seat so your plans pants workout by workout or maybe week by week and that is maybe even more dangerous because then you can fool yourself into thinking that you you actually have a plan because you maybe plan the week's workouts on sunday for the coming week but you you don't have the context of of the bigger picture right and and here's the other thing too is don't be afraid to change the plan too um you know when i start with all my clients their annual training plans will change about four to five times in the season you know, because life happens, you know, 
you know, maybe they have to go on a business trip or they want to go take a vacation with their family. God forbid an injury occurs or, you know, and something on the bet, you know, it, something really nice happens is their performance is moving along faster than we predicted. So we you need to change up the strategy a little bit. So, you know, don't be afraid to change the plan based off what is occurring. Um, you know, what you come in, what you lay out in January may not be the exact plan that you're following in May <laughs> or even yeah, in the, you, so, yeah. Exactly. Exactly. You, you as a military guy probably know what uh, the exact saying is, but it's something like no plan survives the first enemy fire. Oh, it, <laughs> yeah, it, yeah, all plan goes to crap when the first bullet's fired. Yes. It, yeah. <laughs> trust me, after three tours to Iraq, yeah, that is... That's very true. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, so let's uh, move into the rapid fire questions then and uh, answer these in 15 seconds or less. So the first one is, what's your favorite book, blog or resource related to triathlon or endurance sports? Okay, um, you know, if it's bike specific, uh, I have to say, you know, I do like Hunter's uh, Train With Power. It's the most consolidated um, book out there. It's easy. It's an easy read, um, and it help, but it's very scientifically sound. Um, swimming based, uh, I'm, I'm a big proponent of the swim smooth book series. Um, uh, because it, again, it's very similar to the hunter's book. It lays it out very nicely, scientifically sound, and it has great pictures to help show you strokes and stuff, um, and technique. Yeah. Uh, Hunter Allen was on in episode 103. I'll link to that. And I agree with the swim smooth book and I'm, uh, surprised that you're probably the first one who has mentioned it, I think of, uh, 100 plus interviews so so oh, yeah okay. that's a, but that's that's a fantastic resource what's your yeah. favorite piece of gear or equipment um well uh gear my tasneo trainer because i cannot ride outdoors here in panel city beach because of work in the heat so i do a lot of training indoors on zwift uh, uh and so that's what keeps me in shape uh, but secondly is my TT bike. <laughs> um, I'm, I've, like I said, I've been cycling for 20 plus years. I love riding. So what, what brand and model? Um, uh, my, uh, you need to put an S on the back of that. Um, <laughs> so my, t- <laughs> my, my triathlon bike is a Quintana Roo. Um, I got my, I got a good CDO point one. Um, I just, I'm just now building a BMC team machine, um, for time trialing, but I've also got my specialized Roubaix, which has been my workhorse for several years. Um, and I've got a couple of cross bikes in storage right now. Finally, what do you wish you had known or wish you had done differently at some point in your triathlon or endurance sports journey? Calm down. <laughs> um, yeah, I always get myself worked up before a big A race because, you know, we plan for so long and like, okay, it's building to this point. I need to do well. And I stress myself out and there's been times where I should have done well. And I've just, yeah, it didn't go. It went sideways because I did not calm down. <laughs> and at the end of the day is just a race. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Good advice. <laughs> All right, Chris, this has been absolutely brilliant. I really enjoyed talking with you. And yes, uh, is there any, anything uh, that you want to mention before we close off this interview where people can follow you on social media and so on? Yeah, um, you know, they can, follow, they can find me on Facebook. Um, Chris Myers is, uh, M-Y-E-R-S is my handle. Um, I'm slowly getting more intelligent on the social media side of things. Um, but if they can always reach out to me at uh, C Myers at peaks coaching group.com, they have any questions, uh, feel, feel free to email me directly. Um, pretty responsive. And I love talking about this stuff. Brilliant. And, uh, are you taking on clients if somebody is looking for a coach? Yes. Okay. Perfect. We'll link to your bio on, on uh, peaks coaching Great. group as well, of course. Okay. Uh, thanks a lot, Chris, and, uh, talk to you soon. Thank you. Take care. Okay, so that was very, very interesting, I think, and I really hope that you thought so too. My key takeaways here, I have two of them. First, periodization is a tool. It's not gospel. It's not something you should get into paralysis by analysis from, but you should use it as a tool to increase your chances of achieving your goals by having a plan, any plan on that macro level, because that is absolutely critical. 
And my second takeaway is that it is very, very individual. So don't fall in love with any single periodization methodology just because it's hot or new, or even because it's worked for you once. Choose the method that works for you, and if it stops working, then change. So maybe if you have no idea where to start, start with traditional linear periodization. As Chris said, that's also what I would say and, and what I tend to do with the athletes that I coach. But make sure that you manage by measuring your performance. The key metrics of performance is performance. That was maybe a bonus takeaway. And uh, make changes if necessary. So for this episode as for all others you can find the show notes on that triathlonshow.com if you have any questions or comments or want to discuss the episode then do leave comments or questions there i love answering those comments and uh, uh, th- those have been getting more popular so appreciate that and the next episode will be the final installment for now at least in my triathlon nutrition solo episode series that started back in episode 94 and in this final part we'll discuss body composition. Before we close off this episode I want to ask for a small favor and it would be to rate and review the podcast in iTunes. So I want to give two massive shout outs. First to Lee Storr from the United Kingdom. He messaged me on Facebook asking if it's possible for him to review on iTunes, even though he doesn't listen on iTunes, he's not an Apple user at all. And I confirmed that he can download iTunes on Windows and make an account and rate and review that way. And that's what he did. So he downloaded iTunes on Windows for the sole purpose of rating and reviewing the podcast. And I can't thank you enough for this, Lee. You uh, you won't believe how, how much I appreciate it. It. And another one that did this is Brook USA MN. That's an iTunes username uh, writing "Love it, thank, you. thanks so much for your hard work." No, love it, thanks for your hard work. It's my show notes here are, or notes are really small, so I have a difficult time reading them. Uh, I am really enjoying it. I actually listened to it through iHeartRadio, but I was unable to review it through there. I particularly like that you try to make the information applicable to all levels of listeners. So again, somebody not listening on uh, on Apple Podcasts or iTunes, but but using iTunes to rate and review, and that's really that what helps the show the most to rate and review on iTunes. So so if you you see it, these two people are really really helping out here so if you can please do so yourself it helps the show grow rank better and that helps get better or not better but it helps uh, get the most number of uh, guests that i reached out to the bigger the show is of course uh, that increases the success rate and it also very importantly helps convince sponsors to support the show and i could couldn't be doing the podcast the way i am now without sponsors so uh, one episode per week perhaps but no more than that so your rating and reviewing really is a very very important part of keeping the podcast going and stay alive long term big thanks speaking of sponsors to ventum for supporting that triathlon show you can find them on ventumracing.com where you can order your bike online to anywhere in the world so that's another great advantage of getting a ventum you can avoid bike shop markups And thank you to Precision Hydration for sponsoring this episode and for having been sponsored for such a long time. Really appreciate that, guys. Remember to take their free online sweat test on precisionhydration.com to get your personalized hydration strategy for your next race. With the discount code that triathlon show all one word, the first box of electrolyte products that you order is free. Thank you, as always, for listening. Keep training smart and keep loving craft love.